war, tariffs, immigration, and the American dream. Now, these might sound like modern day ideas that you might hear on the evening news, but there was one man and the watch company bearing his name who lived through all of these themes back about a half century ago. Hey guys, I'm Max and welcome back to Retro Watch. So vintage watch collecting to me is a high risk, high reward endeavor. If you don't do your research and you rush into it, you can often get burned. For example, getting a watch in disrepair or worse, getting a Franken watch with mismatched parts. But if you do your homework and you're patient and with a little bit of luck on your side, going vintage opens up a whole world of interesting timepieces. So this story started when I was on the hunt for a Omega Seamaster chronograph from the 60s and 70s. I was really drawn to these watches because they had these colorful dials and they were called the soccer chronographs because they had complications that helped to keep track of two halves of a soccer game. However, these are becoming quite collectible and the prices were just a little bit out of my range. But I noticed when I was looking around that there were many chronographs from different manufacturers during that time period that had a similar look about them. They had similar case shapes, uh, dial arrangements, and they shared the same movements. And that's when I stumbled upon this Wackman chronograph. Now, I never heard of this company before. So I went to the internet and did my research, and what I found out was Wackman was actually a prominent watch company during that time period, and played an integral role connecting the Swiss and the American watch industries. And though Wackman is no longer with us today, this company had a really interesting story to tell. And here's the watch. It's a Wackman chronograph from circa 1970. This particular example has what's called a reverse panda layout with a black dial and silver subdials on top, giving it a very attractive high contrast appearance. And who was Eiko Wackman? He was born in 1895 in Russia to Jewish parents. After the Second World War, he moved to the United States to found the Wackman Watch Company in 1946. There, he collaborated with Breitling to import high quality Swiss timepieces. At one point, he served as the president of the Breitling Watch Corporation of America. This relationship allowed Wackman to access quality Swiss watches and parts and allowed Breitling, then a little known company in the United States, to establish a foothold in this lucrative market. Let's discuss the dimensions. I measure the case diameter of 39 millimeters, though sometimes you'll see it listed as 38. It has a lug width of 20 millimeters and a lug to lug distance of 44 millimeters. The watch is quite thin for a chronograph at just 13 millimeters allowing it to hug and conform to the wrist. And here you can see the very 70s looking cushion shaped case, appearing as if carved out of a solid piece of steel.
Wackman watches shared many parts with the Breitlings and Omegas of the day. Here is the Wackman triple date chronograph from the late 60s. It uses the renowned Valju 72C manual wound movement. Another notable Wackman watch was the sailing themed regatte chronograph from the early 70s. Seen here worn by Clint Eastwood in the movie The Bridges of Madison County. This watch had a Le Mania 1341 automatic chronograph movement. Le Mania based chronograph movements also happen to have powered the watch that went to the moon. A derivative of it is still found in Omega Speedmasters of today. The watch we're looking at here runs a Le Mania 1873 cam-operated lateral clutch manual wound chronograph movement. As said, this is essentially the same movement as the famous Omega Caliber 861. Chronograph complications were difficult to produce and it was customary at that time even for large watch manufacturers such as Omega, Rolex, and Breitling to have sourced these movements from common suppliers such as Le Mania and Valju. Now it is useful to talk about the post-war protectionist period in the American watch industry. During the Second World War, American watch companies had switched their production to wartime products. This put them at a disadvantage since Switzerland was a neutral country. At one point, half of all Swiss watches that were made were imported to America. And so after the war, in an effort to help American watch manufacturers recover, the U.S. government placed tariffs on imported Swiss watches. To get around these tariffs, Wackman opened his own workshop in New York. Using quality Swiss components, he assembled watches bearing the Wackman name. Now there might be debate as to whether these were Swiss versus American made watches, but what can't be argued was Wackman's eye for timeless design, his use of bold and playful colors, and the impeccable build quality of these watches. Based on my research, the dial of this Wackman was actually produced by the famous Swiss dial maker Singer. Singer is perhaps best known for creating the exotic dials of the Paul Newman Rolex Daytona starting in the late 60s. Notice the similarities of the font between the subdials of these two watches. These metallic silver subdials have concentric rings that dance in the light. The loom over the years has turned this creamy custard hue, adding some warmth to an otherwise monotone color scheme. The details on this style really go down a whole other level. Looking with a macro lens, you can see the crisp printing of the tachymeter markers. I find myself admiring the symmetry and intricacies of the dial every time I wear the watch. The last of the iconic Wackman watches was the dive chronograph, nicknamed the Big Boy, owing to its 40mm case. Wackman also had numerous other collaborations, notably his partnership with Charles Gegendet. But like many watch brands, Wackman was a victim of the quartz crisis, being absorbed into the Breitling brand in the mid-1970s. Breitling would unfortunately suffer the same fate just a few years later, folding up shop in 1979. Eiko Wackman was engaged in watch ventures late into his life and passed away in his Florida home in 1981.
Okay, guys. Well, that was the story of the Wackman Watch Company. And also the story of my hunt for a vintage chronograph. If you enjoy the video, be sure to hit the subscribe button below so you don't miss future ones. You can also follow me on Instagram at Retro Watch Channel. So until next time, take care.